Hey everyone, welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Hope everyone had a good Wednesday, I guess. Uh, this is the second class of the term, and I guess the class when we really start learning the content for the course. So if anyone can just type and tell me if the volume is alright for the audio out there, I can get started with the lecture. So, uh, as I said, this is the second lecture, and we are going to start learning about C++. So C++ is the language that we're going to be using for the course, uh, along with the SFML graphics library. And we're going to have two lectures on C++, and as you know, we'll come to learn throughout the course, um, two lectures is not really enough to learn all of C++. It takes a lifetime to learn C++, and maybe even two lifetimes. But we will learn enough C++ to get us through this course, and that's what it's really all about, is showing you the power and the ease of use of modern C++ and getting you hooked on video game programming with C++. So I've got a few slides here. Uh, the layout for today's lecture is I'm going to give you some slides with some like preliminary information on, hey, what is C++? Even if you've used C++ before, maybe you'll learn a little bit from that. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to do some live coding and we'll make a little program in C++. Um, we'll show off some of the features and I have specifically not practiced for the live coding session. Um, and I do that every year because if I just practice, practice, practice and then show you, you know, I've I've got about 15 years of experience with C++, and if I just practiced this live coding session, it wouldn't really give you the full experience. So I'm probably going to make a few mistakes. We're going to show you how to correct those mistakes, and we'll show you how to make a, a simple program in C++. And once we've done these two lectures in C++, then this lecture is when I'm going to show you how to set up your development environment in Windows um, and Linux and Mac for your assignment how to uh, install SFML, and how to get up and running with the actual uh, project files that we're giving you for this year's class. All right, so let's look over at the PowerPoint slides. Let's get this working here. Perfect. All right, so lecture number two, um, the C++ programming language, and a brief introduction to C++, and then we'll do some live coding. And this is part one of two of the C++ lectures. First, before I get started, uh, I just want to tell you that there are excellent references for C++ online. Um, there's a great tutorial here at c++.com slash doc slash tutorial. So if you want to, you know, before the class really gets going, if you want to go practice some C++, that's a great way to do it, um, to follow along with that tutorial. Also, uh, learncpp.com has a great tutorial. They may not be teaching C++ at the same level that we're teaching it in the course. They may go from a very, very ground up approach, but it's not bad to have that, um, that background material. And whenever you Google uh, something about C++, which will be quite often in this course, because I, I still do it, so I assume you're going to do it. Like if you say like how to, f how to read a file in C or C++, sorry, or um, vector in C++ or how to add to a map in C++, this is pretty much the site that you're going to get back. So there's going to be some stack overflow, but this is the go-to reference for all the standard template libraries and functions for C++. Um, you don't really need to bookmark that because every time you Google um, you're going to get this uh, this reference come up. And I apologize if I'm uh, drinking often or uh, if I'm coughing or something like that. I This is my second day of teaching for the year, and if you've never spoken for three hours straight, it takes a bit of a getting used to, so it's still the second term of the year, uh, second lecture of the of the year, so um, I apologize if I'm if I'm um, taking a break every now and then. So, speaking of breaks, what is C++? I'm sure you've all heard of it, probably through horror stories, but uh, I promise you it will not be as bad as you've heard. So C++ is a programming languages that focus on, focuses on runtime speed, so it wants to be able to be as fast as possible, and also on functionality, okay? <clears throat> so you can do pretty much anything in C++. C++ is a compiled language. So there are languages out there that are not compiled. So for example, Python is an interpreted language, meaning, meaning that there's an interpreter that runs in the background that looks at your code line by line and will only throw runtime errors, okay? C++ is a compiled language like Java, right? 
And so you're going to type a command that will compile your code and you may get compiler errors. No, sorry, you will get compiler errors. Um, so just, just know that it's a compiled language. Some people say that C++ is a low level language. I don't think that's true because there's a lot going on under the hood in, um, in the compiler. So low level to me means like full control and C++, you know, you just type a regular program. There's a lot of stuff that the compiler is doing that it's not telling you. So I would say that C++ is a mid to low level programming language if you are obsessed with these sort of um, hierarchies of programming language. So what do I mean by a mid-level programming language? Well, assembly would be a low-level programming language, right? You're, you're speaking almost the same language that the computer understands, and a high-level language would be something like Python, right? Where you're not giving, um, you're not saying as many details when you program, the, the programming language is taking care of a lot more of it for you. But the trade-off with levels of programming languages is that in a high-level language, you're going to have to probably type less code. You're going to get, um, you know, code that looks a little bit more understandable to a new programmer. But the trade-off there is that it won't be as fast, right? So the lower level, ideally, the faster your code can be. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you type in C++ is going to be fast. In fact, when you start out with C++, your code may actually be slower than the same code in Python. And the reason for that is you need to know how to manage things in C++ before it starts to get very fast. So just keep that in mind that C++ is not automatically very fast. So I went online, I found some memes about C++ because I'm a big memer. So like, you know, what are you studying C++? Oh, you poor child. Like, don't worry. It's not going to be as bad as you've heard. All right. I know you've seen all the memes. You've heard all the horror stories. We're going to get through this course. Nobody has ever complained in the history of this course about C++ being the bottleneck, okay? And that doesn't mean that everything else is super hard either. It's just that we teach enough C++ to get you by. You'll be fine. C++ is not something that you can just learn overnight, okay? So it's a lifelong process of learning C++. And probably the most confident you will ever feel about your ability in C++ is right now. Because the more you learn about C++, the more you know that you don't know about C++. <laughs> and so there's a real Dunning-Kruger effect with C++. And uh, just keep in mind that like we're going to be learning, um, but uh, it's not going to be an instantaneous process. So if you have trouble at first, you are not the only one. And of course, I love this one. So, you know, first year uh, of C++, you're going to be hitting this rake. It's going to smack you in the face. 10th year of C++, you're basically doing a lot more fancy stuff before you hit yourself in the face, right? So just keep in mind, I just, you know, just a little bit of humor before we jump into the snake pit of C++. All right. So what are some advantages of C++? There's got to be some advantages or it wouldn't be around, right? All right. So the first advantage, it's very widely used and supported. It's very prevalent in the games industry, especially. So if you're going into the games industry, you probably probably want to know some C++. There are many libraries available for C++. Basically, anything that you can do on a computer, you can find a library out there that does it in C++. The resulting code, and now with a caveat, that the resulting code, if you know what you're doing, can be very fast. So maybe I should change that line, but like properly programmed C++, will be quite fast. Um, the similar, the, the similar, the syntax is very similar to Java and other programming languages that you may be familiar with. Like, no, it's not the same thing as Java, but you will see that if you've programmed in Java, and just please type out in there in the chat if you have programmed in Java, um, or even JavaScript, um, the syntax is quite similar. Um, now, I mean, there are things that are different, obviously. Like, once you start getting into templates and, you know, instead of using like colon colon for namespaces, there's differences. But overall, if you showed someone like who didn't know programming, a C++ program and a Java program, they would almost look identical, right? C++ programmers get hired, right? Um, okay, so a lot of people have used Java, that's, that's excellent. Um, if you can program in C++, you've kind of, you know, that's sort of the boot camp of programming languages, right? So a lot of companies out there, if you can program in C++, you can certainly program in Python, right? So C++ programmers, you're gonna you're gonna get hired. 
Um, the code is highly customizable. So you can operator overload, you can define things. That ends up being one of the disadvantages of well, as well. But like, it's your playground. C++ is, your, is yours to shoot yourself in the foot with, right? And C++ will be around for a long time. Um, it's not going anywhere. You know, there's all these memes out there about like, you know, every year there's a new C++ killer, like Rust or uh, I can't remember Google's new language that they think they're going to end up supporting. That'll be like the, the, what is it? The Google wave of programming languages. There's lots of languages out there that are supposed to be the C++ killer, right? There's lots of MMOs out there that are supposed to be the WoW killer. It's not going anywhere. It's, it, C++ is, is here to stay. That being said, there are some disadvantages of C++. It's very easy to write unsafe code and to crash in C++. That is probably the biggest disadvantage, or at least it used to be the biggest disadvantage, right? There are modern C++, it is very easy to write safe code. However, the possibility exists that you'll still write unsafe code, okay? So you must manage your own memory. So it is not a garbage collected language. This is a turnoff to many new um, programmers because managing memory is not something you really want to learn about as your first programming language. And maybe you do. I don't know. There's different schools of thought there. But what we'll show in this course is through a technique called RAII and through the, the factory um, that we'll make uh, for the entity manager you will never have to worry about memory once we get our engine up and running, okay? So even though you have to manage your own memory, there are good software engineering principles in C++ so that it almost looks like you don't have to manage your own memory. The syntax of C++ can be a little bit confusing, okay? We will handhold you through that. Don't worry about that. Um, I would say that maybe the biggest disadvantage of a seasoned C++ programmer is that it can be hard to read other people's code sometimes. And the reason for that is because of one of the advantages of C++ is that there's custom definitions, there's operator overloading, there's all sorts of ways that you can customize the things that your code does to the point that if I'm just looking at one screen of code, the same code in my library may actually be doing a different thing than in your library. So it can actually be a little bit hard to read other people's code if they've gone down that rabbit hole of, of all these custom definitions and stuff. All right. And of course, of course, probably your biggest worry this term will be interpreting compiler and linker errors in C++. Because, you know, there's that meme that, you know, your experience of C++, you know, the time spent coding, like typing characters, versus dealing with compiler and linker errors is probably going to be similar to this graph for the first little while, right? Um, and also, C++ doesn't know what to do with a zero, right? Is it an int? Is it a bool? Is it a pointer? Is it an array? Is it a null? Like, so there's all these memes about C++ and how it treats some data structures. And this is true if you do really, really old school, low level, C++ programming, but don't worry, we probably won't run into this, this kind of stuff um, in our course. Before we talk about C++, I'm going to talk about like a little bit of the history. I'm not going to dive too far into the weeds, but we need to talk about the C programming language. C was created by Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs in the 1970s. Please say something out there in the chat if you've, uh, if you've used C++. Ooh, I have a little poll thing out here. All right, so um, let me add an option programming languages you have used. I, f I didn't realize there was a poll here. This is great. So let's go with uh, C, C++. I'm just, I'm not going to list every programming language. Uh, Java, Python. Uh, okay, I can only have four options. So let's ask my community. All right, so I've got a poll out there. I think you can click that in the chat. Maybe it's at the top of the chat. <clears throat> That's my first ever poll on YouTube. <coughs> Excuse me. So look for that and uh, and uh, answer that, that poll for me. So the C programming language was created in the 1970s. It's available on nearly every platform. I assure you that if you have a piece of hardware, C runs on that piece of hardware. It probably runs on your oven. 
or your stove, right? Like there's C is out there for everything. It's crazy. It is a procedural low to mid level language. Oh, you can only select one option in the poll. Oh, sorry about that. Um, okay. Well, I know that for the future. So polls are multiple choice, not multiple select. So thank you for that. Um, I guess that poll is useless, but a lot of people, half the class said they've used C. So that's great. All right. So C is a procedural mid to low level language. There is no built-in object oriented um, programming in C. So C is very popular for system software. Very famously, Linux is written in C um, for writing drivers, embedded stuff, operating systems, etc. Okay, so C is the programming language you probably want to use um, when you want things as fast as possible, as low level as possible, and you want your executable size to be as small as possible. Okay, and C, of course, greatly influenced the development of C++. So what is C++? Well, the C++ programming language was created by Bjorn at Bell Labs. And originally, he called it C with classes. Okay, so C++ was called C with classes in 1983. And it is, again, a procedural language. And you can say that it is a superset of C. Now, I know people who are very, very good C++ programmers, far better C++ programmers than me, that take issue with the calling of C++ a superset of C. And what do I mean by a superset of C? It means that basically anything you can do in C can also be done in C++. So like if you write almost any C program, a C++ compi compiler can handle it. However, there are exceptions to this. What those exceptions are barely ever come up in practice, okay? So don't come yelling to me that, oh, I found an example. Like, for all practical purposes, you can write C inside a C++ program. I don't think anyone could argue with that. It's, it's just me saying that this is like how C relates to C++, is that C++ contains C with, you know, quotation marks around contains, and then there's more functionality on top of that. A lot more functionality, almost to the point where like it, when you wrote older C++, you would see a lot of C-like syntax, but in modern C++, you almost never want to see C-like syntax. Unless, you know, I say these things, there's always caveats. Of course, some people, you, like some people use C++ to just say, um, use C with templates, right? So some people want C to have templates, so they use C++ for that. That's fine, that's a very niche example, but in this we are going to be making full use of C++ with the standard template library and modern functionality. Okay. Um, C++ supports object-oriented programming, so we have classes, we have inheritance, and we have generics, meaning that we can have a vector of ints, right? So we have templates in C++, we'll get all into that uh, in the next lecture. Um, it maintains the efficiency of C, of course, maybe not 100% the efficiency of C, but within a few percent of C. Uh, and it's very, very popular in video game development. And C++ helped influence the development of other languages such as C, C Sharp and Java. All right. Now we have to talk about C++ versions, because just like Python has versions, Java has versions, C++ has versions. And C++ versions actually do matter. So C++ first appeared, like it was created in 83. The, the official name was in 85. Um, the first final standardized version, final, I say, was C++ 98. And that is, C++ 98 is, I think, what ruined a lot of people for C++. Things were very verbose. They were kind of hard to do. Um, Iterators were very verbose, like lots of things in C++ 98 were very annoying. C++ 11 came along with many, many new features and quality of life improvements. And I think C++ 11 is where I started to really love C++ and a lot of people because it really did, um, it brought modern C++ into the era of ease of programming with things like Java and Python, right? Then there's C++ 14, 17, 20, I think 2022 20, is either out or in product. Like 
there's lots of different versions. It's basically the year that it was released and they all introduce new um, features, some of which you may run into, some of which you, you may never run into. I think I have used a total of two features from C++20 that weren't in C++17 and I write a lot of C++ code. We will be using at least C++17 in this course, okay? So there's a lot of nice new functionality over C++98 uh, and the compiler flag we're using is, so in order to tell your compiler to use the new functionality, because for some reason it defaults to the old functionality, um, is you have to say dash standard equals C++17. Okay, so when you, when you run your compiler, you have to put that in the command um, now, Visual Studio will do that for you. We'll set that in the project files, but if you're doing this command line, you just have to make sure that you do that. So we've got this sort of like, you know, it kind of seems like this from the outside where someone took C and made C++ and then, you know, you, you sort of just keep adding on. And this is actually like a legitimate issue. I, I sort of display this as a meme, but like as more and more functionality gets added to C++, as someone who loves C++, you almost wish that they could like tear it down and just make a new one and not have the old stuff in it. And so it's some stuff gets deprecated, some stuff gets added. It's a little bit annoying. You won't have to worry about any of that in this course, of course. We're just going to use the C++ that I show you. But it is kind of an issue. And, you know, when you're evangelizing the use of a language for a course, you should also say the bad things about a course, right? Or sorry, the bad things about a language. And this is, I would say it is a bad thing about C++ is like over time, the amount of stuff that gets added to it gets a little bit confusing and makes it a little bit ugly and stuff like that. But again, you won't have to worry about all that in this course. Okay. What are some properties of C++? C++ is statically typed. Okay. So variables, um, are defined and typed before they are used, right? So if you've if you've used C or you've used Java, it's the same thing. But if you've used Python, Python is not a. Uh, well, well I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So if we want to have a year, we have to have it declared as whatever data type we want. So for example, years are integers, right? So int year equals 2018, 2022, whatever. You can tell when I made these slides, right? Uh, Java and C are also statically typed. Variable, variable types are defined at compile time, okay? So later on, if I want to have year store a floating point, I can't do that. It's defined at compile time, okay? Python and JavaScript are dynamically typed. So you would just say num equals 10, right? So the variable types are defined at runtime. If you want to overwrite that variable that was an integer with a string, you can totally do that. Right? So just realize that like C++ is statically typed and Python and other, some other languages are dynamically typed. So let's look at your first C++ program. And of course, we are a computer science course. We've got to use the hello world. So this is your first C++ program. It prints hello world to the screen. I am going to go through this line by line for the people who are new to C++. And maybe for, even if you've typed this in before, maybe you don't exactly understand what's going on, right? And if you've never seen C++ before, if you're used to other programming languages, this may be what you're looking at, right? Okay, console.log hello. Yeah, that makes sense. Here we've got some JavaScript. System.out.print hello. Okay, it's printing out to the system. Hello, yeah, okay, I can see that. Standard colon colon C out left left hello left left standard. Yeah. Like, what is all this stuff, right? It looks like a foreign language. Well, it might be a foreign language. It's, it is a language, right? But what does all this stuff mean? Why is it like that? We're going to explore why it's like that and why to me, it's actually better like that. Okay. So let's go through that hello world program line by line. And you might, at this point you're saying, oh my God, he's teaching like hello world and we're going to be making a full game engine. Yes. It's, it's remarkable how quickly you can learn enough C++ to program games. So don't, don't worry, we're not going too slow. It will ramp up in, in a couple of lectures. So include IO stream. That's the very first thing that happens in your program. What the hell is that? So the first line is called a preprocessor directive, okay? So we're gonna talk about the preprocessor later, 
But essentially, this hashtag include is used to include a C++ library, right? So you've probably seen this in Java before. Uh, does Java use include? Yeah, I think Java's include or import. Uh, this has been 10 years since I've written a Java program. Um, so in, in, you know, in Python, you've got import in C and C++, you've got include. So you've got include and the name of that library. This particular library, IO stream, is used for input and output streams, okay? So what is a stream? We will be talking about what a stream is, but an IO stream, or sorry, IO stream will allow us to use the standard C out to print to the console. So standard C out is the object, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, that lets us print to the console, okay? So let's move on, and I'll, I'll give more details on all this later. I'm just going through line by line. Next, we have int main int arg c comma char star arg v bracket bracket. Okay, so if you are familiar with, with Java, right, that's your public static void main string args. That's the exact same thing. That's what this is. Each C++, C++ program must have a main function, which is run when the program starts. So you've got to have a main. All right, that's the same thing with Java. Okay, with Java console apps, at least. Um, the contents of this function are enclosed in brackets, just like in Java. The main function has an int return type, okay? So this int here, in, in, um, in Java, for example, it's public static void main. Void does not have a return type in Java. It does have a return type in C. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. The main function has int return type. argc is the number of program arguments, and argv is the array of strings that you pass into it. So string args in Java, Java strings are objects, and Java arrays are objects. So the Java array object knows its own length, okay? In now, this is, we'll get into pointers and all kind of stuff later, uh, later, but the whole reason for this int arg c is because a raw C++ array pointer does not know its own length. So we've got to pass in the, um, the array itself as well as the, the length of that array. And this just processes command line arguments. So if you type your program and then a bunch of arguments after it, that's what this is processing, okay? We're actually not going to use this whatsoever in the course. It's just, it's just there, okay? And I believe you could actually just type int main without this. It might throw you an error in one compiler, it might not in another compiler, but it's, it is what it is. All right, standard C out, this thing, what the hell is that? Hello world slash n, okay. So this prints the line, or it, this line prints the string hello world with a new line character to the console. All right, what is this STD? I'm calling it standard, some people call it std, some people call it STD, I call it standard. So standard is a namespace. We'll, we'll have more on namespaces later, but just think of a namespace as like, if you have a bunch of code that you've written, say for a library, and in Java, you might say my, like library dot function name. Here you can say um, namespace colon colon. So there's a, there's a namespace called standard and in that namespace, there's a whole bunch of functionality. Okay, we'll get into more of that later. Um, inside that namespace, created for you is this C out output stream, okay? So C out is a variable that lives in the standard namespace. It is a stream and this is called an operator. So an operator just like plus or just like minus, okay? This is an operator that sends, the, the cool thing about this is that at first the syntax is a little confusing, but my intuition is that whatever is here gets sent that way, left, to this variable, okay? So this is a binary operator. Uh, someone said that this colon colon is called the scope resolution operator. Yes, 
I'm, I'm trying not to over overload with too many details, but yes, this, this talks about the scope and the scope of this is within that namespace. And so you can think of this as piping that string into this variable. And as long as this variable knows how to deal with this operator, which we'll get into later, um, it will do its thing. And the thing that standard C out does is send it to the console, okay? And this can be used to print any base C++ type, so as well as strings. So if you've got a string, if you've got um, uh, an int, if you've got a float, you can just print those out to the, um, to the console. And if you define your own class and you want it to be able to print, you can actually define what this operator does within your class so it can be printed out to the console like this as well, okay? Just similar how to Java has a toString method and when you print it, it uses the toString. It's the same sort of thing. And of course, each C++ statement must end in a semicolon, okay? So we've got a semicolon at the end. And be very careful that C++ is case sensitive, okay? Just like most programming languages, it is case sensitive. At the very end, we have a return zero. Main, as we said, has a return type of int. But you'll say this is main. Main doesn't get called by any other function. Uh, why do we have a return type? But it turns out that main does have a function that calls it, and that's the system. The system calls main, right? And so the system wants to know, hey, program, did you work okay? <laughs> right? Java will take care of that for you. C won't take care of that for you. So essentially what we do is if we've reached the end of our program successfully, we return zero. And that tells the operating system to inform the user that everything ran smoothly, okay? If you want to, throughout your program, you could say if, if uh, you were trying to read from a file, for example, and you didn't find the file, you could say return negative one or something like that. You could have an error code that you return. And so you return something else if there's an error and that is used by other programs to detect errors, okay? So you can return whatever you want, but basically we're only gonna be returning zero in this course because we're not getting into like systems programming and stuff. The program may compile and run without this return integer, but it's highly recommended, just return zero so the, the system knows that um, you're okay. All right. White space in C++. If you're coming from Python, this is going to look like a disaster. But if you're coming from Java, you're already familiar with this, right? For the most part in C++, white space doesn't matter. You can put as many spaces as you want between things. Now, of course, if you have a variable name, you can't put a space between the C and the out here, right? Your, your strings and your variables all, all have to be, you know, they have to be formatted correctly. But this line is equivalent to this line, is equivalent to this line, is equivalent to these two lines, right? For the most part, it doesn't matter, even with functions, right? You can put the brackets in any places that you want. Now this would, you know, it would be kind of ugly if you did it in some of these ways. However, there are some exceptions. Um, and the white space exceptions for C++ are, now this is not all of the exceptions, but it's a couple, a couple of them. Um, you cannot separate strings by a um, by a new line. So if you wanted to print out hello world, oh, give me one second here. Apologies for this. I've got uh, some notifications going on in the background. I just want to turn those off in case you can hear them through the. Alrighty, we are back. Okay, so. White space. White space, yeah, so strings cannot be separated by new lines, all right? So this will not work. This will actually not compile. And comments cannot be separated by new lines either, okay? So slash slash, that's a comment. You can't do a single line comment across multiple lines. You can have multi-line multi, multi -line comments. There's another syntax for that, but a single line comment cannot be separated. And there's a couple of more, uh, if you really want to go down in the weeds with the, the white space, you can, but all right. Indentation embraces. I know that this is a religious argument and I am not trying to evangelize or convert, but one of the things that happens when you are programming for a career is that when you go to a company, you have to conform to their style. 
because no particular style is correct and no particular style is incorrect, but the incorrect thing to do is to mix styles, okay? So if you come from Java, JavaScript, a, a lot of other programming languages, this is standard, okay? This is the K and R variant um, of, of, of braces where you have a block of code and the thing start, the, the open bracket is on the same line. Almond, okay, is when your bracket starts on the next line. I particularly enjoy Almond style when it comes to C++. I actually have reasons for why I like Almond style. We will be using the Almond style for our assignments in this course. Now, you might say, oh my God, I can't read code like that. Okay, I understand. I came from here. I do, did, did this for 10 years, all right? until I saw this. And I know that it adds an extra line to your code, right? Not as efficient, whatever. However, when you're doing algorithmic programming, like I do a lot, sometimes you get some nested loops, some nested ifs, stuff like that. And when you can visually match the closing and ending of a function or a block of code vertically like this, it actually kind of works wonders. And I find this type of code, while it is more compact, it's a little bit more difficult to read code in this style than in this style once you get used to this style a bit. So that's all I'll say about it. I know that there are people out there who will have valid reasons for using this as well. And when I use JavaScript, I still use this style, so I understand. But in this course for C++, we're going with the almond style and I will just like, I'm not going to be like a huge stickler about it, but I will be telling the TAs, look for almond style and just ping them like 1%, maybe 2% on an assignment just to get you into our style. Okay, so we're going to be using almond style. The C++ standard template library is a collection of classes and functions available within the C++ language. So C++ has a bunch of libraries that come with it in the STL. They are like Java's libraries, right? You have to include them and then they do some cool stuff. So if I want to use a string, I've got to include that somehow. If I want to use a vector, I got to use that somehow. If I want to read from a file, I've got to include that somehow. And all of that lives in the standard library. Now the standard library doesn't do things like graphics, right? So that's why in this course, our only external library is going to be SFML, which is a simple, fast multimedia library, which allows us to draw things to the screen, load images and do mouse and keyboard handling. Cause that's the only thing that we need that is not handled by the basic library. So STL, for example, has strings, it has input output, it has streams, files, it has a bunch of containers, it has algorithmic um, like sorting, min, max, shuffle, it has container functionality, we can fill a container, we can erase things and stuff. So all of that is in the STL and I'll show some examples of that. Um, you must include whatever library you're using in your C++ program and these are referenced via the standard namespace. So it's called the standard library, standard template library. We'll talk about templates later. Um, and so it's in the standard library and you, you, didn't, you wouldn't want to have to type standard library dot whatever, right? So they just said standard. So that's the, that's the namespace. And so you say standard string, standard vector. So namespaces, as I said, I was going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, they encapsulate code, right? So it's just like the scope of the code is within this namespace. So for example, if I had a namespace and I had some variables in there, let's say uh, I had some physics namespace, right? If I wanted to store a bunch of physics variables, like this, uh, the acceleration due to gravity or some uh, constants out there, like a bunch of constants, right? Maybe what I'd want to do is create a namespace for those so that when you went to look for those constants, you'd know where to find them. They're in that namespace. So for example, if I have a Dave, namespace, I would say namespace Dave, and I would encapsulate that by brackets, and then I would put my variables in there. So for example, if I have an int, I'm going to call it ivar for int var, and that's equal to 10, or I could have um, float 
gravity equals whatever 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, if I want to reference that later, I can say Dave colon colon Ivar. So this colon colon just says look it up within that namespace or that's that scope of the code and get us that. So the things we'll be we will be seeing in this course by far the most often will be standard string, standard vector, and standard map. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll okay. I'll get into using namespace standard later, but we're not going to do it in this course. I know it always comes up. All right. C++ source code. I've talked now about like the high level uh, details of the language. Let's get into some code. So the code of your program is written in files. Now the compiler really doesn't care what the extension of your file is, right? As you get more familiar with computers, you know that it's the content of the file that matters and not the actual extension, right? Um, so you can write source code in any extension that you want. However, there are standards, right? There are conventions and we're going to adhere to those conventions. So program code is going to be written in .cpp files, okay? Now Java will enforce you to have them in .java files. C++ does not enforce you to put them in .cpp files, but I am enforcing you put, to put them in .cpp files. So for example, we will have main.cpp, right? That'll be where our code is. Um, and we'll have a bunch of different files for our assignments, but I'll talk about that when we get to the assignments. You may see in uh, older legacy code bases, uh, these are sometimes it's dot capital C for C++ code, um, dot lowercase c conventionally is uh, C code, not C++ code, code or dot CPP. Um, we're going to be using dot CPP. All right, it's lowercase. That's what we're going to be doing. Um, if you go work somewhere else, just conform to whatever they do. It's not hard, right? And CPP code is is used for function and class definitions. All right. So now comes the biggest change between Java and C++ in terms of managing files and code is that we also have in C++ header files. So there's code files, program code files, the .cpp files, and we also have header files, .h files. And these are used for function and class declarations. So declarations versus definitions. When I get into the um, when I get into the live coding, I'm going to show you a good example of that, and I'll have a, an example in the slides. But just know that there's a difference for now, and we will get into it. All right. But first, I want to talk to you about the C++ compilation process. All right. So C++ programs are compiled into binary executable files that are run directly by the CPU. So there's no virtual machine like Java. When you uh, compile Java into a class file, it's actually run by the Java virtual machine, okay? And if you run Python code, that is interpreted on the fly by Python. If you run JavaScript code, it's interpreted by the JavaScript engine. So the fact that it's actually compiled into a binary, which is directly readable by your CPU, that is advantageous because it usually results in faster execution, but at the price of usually lower level programming, right? But we'll show you in this course how modern C++, it's actually pretty high level programming. There are many, many different C++ compilers for many different operating systems. We'll talk about a few of them in this course. Now, the full process by which C++ goes from source files to executables is a little bit complicated, okay? But I want to explain it to you because it is necessary to understand this, at least at a basic level, in order to um, interpret and fix errors that you might have that you come across in this course, okay? And in your C++ career. So here, um, up, up here it says sourcecode.c. That's because I stole this from a, a website that does C programming, but the process is exactly the same for C and C++, okay? Now, exactly, okay, with a little difference, but for all intents and purposes, it's the same. The very first thing that happens is that all of your source code and all of your header files are run through the preprocessor, okay? So all of your header files and all of your source code files go through the preprocessor. And the preprocessor does things like include whatever, 
okay? Define pi 3.1415926, whatever. So any preprocessor commands that you have in your code, the very first thing that happens is that it says, okay, um, run it through the preprocessor. Now, there could be errors at the preprocessor level of, of this stage, okay? So for example, if you said include this file and the preprocessor can't find that file, then that is actually an error that's thrown at the preprocessor level. So it hasn't even started to compile your code yet because you said, hey, preprocessor, go grab this file and include it for me, okay? So one stage of possible errors is the preprocessor stage. Once the preprocessor has run, essentially what the preprocessor does, it's a, it's a big find and replace tool, okay? So if you say include math.h, what that command literally does is it goes and takes math.h, copies it, and puts it right there in your program. It literally copies the whole file, okay? So what happens then is after your source code and your header files are pre-processed, the pre-processor spits out an expanded source code file, right? With all of those libraries that you included at the very top of your program or wherever you included them. So then you've got a huge source code file and that is what gets spit into the process, to the, to the compiler, okay? So the pre-processor output is run through the C++ compiler. So now you could have an error at the compiler stage, right? So for example, a, comp a compiler error might be trying to reference a variable um, that isn't there, right? Or uh, trying to declare an int as a float or something like that, or your function has the wrong syntax, right? So syntactic things, and a bit of semantics, but mostly syntactic things will happen at the compiler stage, right? Not the preprocessor stage. Once your compiler has run, then object files are created. So if you've ever used Java and you've compiled a bunch of different Java files, right? Into a bunch of different class files, that's kind of like what an object file is, okay? Each of your .cpp files is going to produce a .o file. And so that's what this stage is. The object files are created. And then the linker is run and the linker is going to link the object files together in order to finally produce the executable, okay? So again, source code and header files go through the preprocessor. It does its thing, creates an expanded source file, which is then compiled. The compiler creates object files and the linker links all the object files together, boom. Now, I know that that sounds like super complex, but it's basically going to be done for you. Um, you can do all of this in a single command, okay? And if you just type like G++ my program, all that is done for you. However, this is the actual process because a linker error is going to have to be fixed in a different way than a compiler error, right? So once we get into the course, I'll show you some examples of those and how to fix them. Alrighty. So the G++ preprocessor function, I think I meant to say C++ here. Um, so the preprocessor functionality that I talked about, um, the preprocessor runs all specific preprocessor directives. So what is a preprocessor directive? Well, most of the ones that you'll see, see are either includes or macros. Okay, so for example, if I want to include a library that's, in, that's included in the system somewhere, I would say include library. Or if I want to include a specific file that is not in my system library, I would say include specific file. Or if I want to define some constant, like, like this limit, 100, or I can define these very simple macros here that are kind of like functions, but not really like functions. These are preprocessor directives, okay? In this course, we will only be using the first two um, because these are quite dangerous and we won't, there's other ways to do them in modern C++, so don't worry. If we ever say include X, this inserts file X into the file. Like I said before, it inserts the entire text from myobject.h into the file calling the include. Now, Turns out that it will usually only do it the first time you call it. If you say it twice in a row, we have some things to prevent it from including it multiple times, but it will just include that text there. Alrighty. The C++ 
compiler. There are several popular compilers that are used on different operating systems. Um, so on Linux and Mac, I would recommend one of the following if you're using Linux or Mac for this course, either the GNU C compiler, GCC, which has C++ support, so G++ or Clang, okay? Clang has a slight, as per as LV, LVM and all this stuff I'm not going to get into, but basically these are the two compilers that I would recommend. Just use G++, it's fine. Um, in Windows, there are different compilers in Windows, but please only use Visual Studio if you're doing this for Windows, okay? Windows is a nightmare to set up C++ compilers in, except Visual Studio. If you want to set up anything but Visual Studio in, in, in Windows, it's a goddamn nightmare. Trust me. I, I'm saying that MinGW exists, but for the purposes of this course, it doesn't exist. All you have to do for this course, we'll get into this in assignment one, is install Visual Studio, double click the project file and hit compile. That's it. Please don't do anything else for Windows. You're just putting yourself through torture. Visual Studio will actually do the same things that we've been talking about behind the scenes, um, but it does it kind of transparently, right? It's go it, it controls the compiler, it controls the IDE, um, it does all that for you behind the scenes so you don't have to worry about it. That's the great thing about Visual Studio. But it's still important to know the entire process because inside Visual Studio, if you get a link error, LNK error, you got to know that that's a linker error. So it probably means that a library was misspelled or something like that. If you get a compiler error, you need to know, okay, it's probably a syntax thing, right? So you still got to know what the process is. All right. So if you want to compile an actual C++ program, what are you going to do? Well, let's say we have a program written in myprogram.cpp. Um, we're going to co compile out the code into an executable, right? So we can say G++, myprogram.c++. That's it. So all that whole process that we just talked about for 10 years is, is just that. We type it and it does it, right? It does it for us. And that is going to produce an executable file called a.out. Why that's the default program name, I don't know. But I guess it's A is the first letter. Dot out means it's the output of the compiler, but there it is, A dot out. That's a terrible name. So let's specify a program no name, okay? Someone asked about VS Code. No, this is very important. Visual Studio is not Visual Studio Code. There is one program that is called Visual Studio. It is a huge IDE by Microsoft that includes a C++ compiler, debugger, um, all sorts of great tools for C++. It's called Visual Studio, okay? I know it's confusing, but then there's this other thing that is called Visual Studio Code. It is a separate program. It's, I don't know why they did this. I guess to save on branding, but VS Code or Visual Studio Code is not Visual Studio. It has nothing to do with Visual Studio. It never had anything to do with Visual Studio. So Visual Studio, do not, do not use VS Code if you're on Windows. VS Code, you can use it if you're on Mac or Linux to edit your programs. That's fine. It's a, it's a text editor with plugin support right? It's not a compiler. So VS Code, not a compiler. Visual Studio is a compiler. I'm going to get 10 emails about that, so I've got to, I've got to repeat it. All right. Back to this. We've got our a.out. It's terrible. We don't want that. So let's specify the output file name, okay? So I can say g++ myprogram.cpp dash o myprog, okay? So my program. And then if you're in the console, you can run that with dot slash my program. All right. Now in Windows, you would just hit compile and run and it would compile it and run it for you. Or you would double click the executable. All right. But if you're on the console, if you're using Mac, if you're using Linux, you're probably going to be using the console. So you just run it like that. And then if you had any arguments, remember our argc, you would type my program, argument one, argument two, argument three. All right. If you want, you can get fancy with the compiling. 
So if we want to actually view the results of what the preprocessor did, we can do that with dash E, okay? So G++ dash E, myprogram.c or .c++. Um, and then you say, well, this is a command line thing where you pipe it into another file, okay? So the output of that will either print to the screen or you can put it in a file. All right, uh, someone asked, is the executable the same as the binary? Yes, for the, for the purposes. So a binary file, typically, the definition of a binary file is something that's in a binary format that is not human readable. But when you're talking about the compilation of a program, the resulting binary is interchangeable with saying the resulting executable, okay? Technically, not all binaries are executable, meaning that they can be executed and run as code, but we're, we're using them interchangeably for this. All right, so, oh, just one second, if you give me one second. So someone in the after last class said that they wanted to see George again. George just visited. So say hello to George. George is an expert at C++. He has four years of C++. He has three internships. Um, but uh, he, he got fired for sleeping on the job. So, all right. So I'm going to let George down. I'm going to keep typing here. So we have... I, that's the favorite part of everyone's lecture is seeing the animals, I know. All right, so he's the TA. No, he's not the TA because he's too expensive. I can't, I can't afford him for the TA. I should pay him to sleep, yeah. By the way, because this is like the tutorial lecture, I want to give you as much information as possible. I know that some people are just going to skip this, so this lecture is going to go a little bit long, okay? But I want to give you as much information as possible and like, you know, we got, we got time, so I can say... Okay, George is actually back there um, messing with some hardware, so I'm just gonna put him out of the. I'm gonna put him out of the room. One second. So we'll we'll say hi to George once more. Say goodbye, George. I love George. He's awesome. He was named after George Costanza, by the way, because he's a little bit. Uh, he's a little bit of a big ferret. All right, all right. I'll be right back. Okie dokie. George is very happy to have met you as well. All right, so if we want to specifically compile to an object file instead of directly to the executable, we can do that, right? And it turns out we may have to do that when we get bigger and bigger programs. And so you'd say g++-c myprogram.c and that will produce myprogram.o and then you run the linker, which is actually the same program. You say G++ O my program. So that says run, run the compiler, but link these object files together. So the G++ does everything for you. Okay. Um, and spe depending on the file that you specify, it will know that, okay, this is a, 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 a source code file or it is a, um, an object file and it'll do the correct thing. Okay. Now in this class, I'm gonna give you a make file and a make file is essentially a configuration file for G++. I know it's not, but essentially it is. And all you'll have to do in this class is type make. All right. So multiple files can be compiled in one step. If you want, you can compile all of your CPP files and it will not generate the intermediate object files. However, if you do it this way, it recompiles every CPP file each time. And you might not think that that matters, but once you get into like, you know, actual retail code, or if you're in industry or something, if you've got thousands of CPP files, it's really expensive. Like it takes minutes, if not hours. I know someone who worked at Facebook and it took like two hours to recompile everything, right? So ideally you don't want to compile all of your files every time. And one of the great things about the linker, even if it is a little bit complicated, is that if you've only changed a couple of your files, then you only want to recompile the things that you've changed because linking is much faster than compiling. So what ideally what you would want to do 
is only compile the files that have changed since the last time you compiled and generate the new object files if there are CPP file changes and just link them together. And so this can be done with a number of different systems. Um, in Mac and Linux, you're gonna be using the make file that I give you. This is automatically done by the uh, project file in Visual Studio, okay? So again, just as a, you know, a breakdown, that, that's what it is. Source code goes through the preprocessor, preprocessor go, uh, output goes through the compiler and the object files go to the linker. Someone asked, are object files binary files? Yes, they are. They are binary files, but they are not executable, okay? They are intermedi intermediate output binary files that are then linked together to form the executable program. It's a good question. Alrighty, so the separation of CPP and H files. I mentioned this briefly before, but why do we do this? A Java file just has all the code there, right? Why do we do this in C and C++? So C++, oftentimes when it comes to class code, is often separated into two files. The header file with the declarations and the CPP file with the definitions or the implementations. So a declaration is something like this. A declaration says, hey, a function that takes these inputs has this name and has this type of output, it exists, okay? So the function sum, which takes in two ints, x and y, and returns an int, that function exists. That's what this file is saying. That's what this line is saying. It's a declaration. You know, I declare bankruptcy. No, I declare int sum in x. That's a declaration. A definition is the actual code of the function, okay? So what the function actually does. So it would be int sum this return x plus y. Now, that's the definition. That's the difference between a declaration and a definition, okay? Header files. They contain class or function declarations. Declarations include the function name, return type, arguments, etc. It is required by C++ to see all declarations of all classes, functions, and variables before they are used. Okay? That means before in the file. So if at any point you scan from top to bottom in a file, I'll give an example of this in the live coding. If you see a variable or a function that didn't appear literally above it in the code, it won't be able to do anything with it. So these serve several useful purposes but beyond just the required declarations. So I'll show you what that is for now. All right. So say we are at some point in our code, right? And we've got this function. And inside this function, we have an object called my class. So we have a class that we've written somewhere. I don't know where it is right now, right? But I have a class. And inside that class, I have a function called do something. If this is all that you see in your program, we can't say, okay, my class C, because my function, oh, sorry. Uh, that last part, just ignore it. Say we have our, our function somewhere in our code, okay? Now what we have to do is we have to write our class, my class. Where are we going to put that in our code? Let's say all of our code had to be in one file, right? Let's just say that it, it had to be that way. Um, so we actually, let's say, oh, I kind of want that class to be at the bottom of this file because I, I don't want it to be up at the top. I want more important stuff at the top that I'm gonna be editing more often. Well, it turns out that you actually can't define your class below where you reference it in the code because the function can't see it yet. The compiler goes from top to bottom. It's real dumb, okay? And if it hasn't seen my class yet, it doesn't know what to do. So you have to define your my class above where you call it, right? So you could define it up here. So it gets real annoying defining all of your classes in the same file, all right? So 
what you have to do, well, or what you should do, is whenever you declare a class, like whenever you have a new class, you put it in its own file, right? And then in order for this function to be able to see it, what you would do is you would include that class here. So if you've got all the code for your my class uh, object in my class.h, then what you would do is somewhere above this my class, you would include my class.h. And remember what the include function does? It literally takes all of my class.h and inserts it into the file here. So it's kind of like the compiler thinks you typed it in all there because what the preprocessor does is it takes that file and it puts it there, okay? And so some people in the chat out there are giving really specific technical names for stuff. Um, I'm not going that deep, so I appreciate you giving more information to people, but there's a little bit of information overload and I don't want to, um, to, to give that. Now, in any other, almost any other programming language, JavaScript, Java, etc. Um, no, don't, don't apologize. I just can't, I'm, I'm not going to mention everything that's said in the chat. That's all. But thank you for, for giving the information. I just wanted to let you know why I'm not saying everything that's said in the chat. But a good point is that in other languages, it would let you type your my class down here, right? It would let you type another function down there. That's because their compiler does a number of passes through and resolves all of those things. If it didn't see it the first time, it will see it the next time, okay? So other programming languages let you do that. C and C++ do not let you do that. But using header files, it'll be fine. We won't need to worry about that. All right, so some of the benefits of header files. Here is a actual class that we're going to be writing in this course, okay? This is the vec2 class, and it has an x and a y and a bunch of functions. So, what are the benefits of header files? They allow you to see the entire functionality of a class at once, right? So, these functions here, these are function declarations or definitions? Someone answer out there in the chat. Are these declarations or are these definitions? What goes in the header file? Perfect, all right. They're declaring, they're declaring that these functions exist. So these are declarations, everybody got it right. So if I look over here, I can see at a, at a glance, oh wow, okay, so this class has an X and a Y in it. It has a couple of different constructors. It has an equals operator. I can add, subtract, divide, multiply. That's cool. I can see everything about that class on one screen. That's a huge cognitive benefit, okay? Reduces cognitive load. I don't need to scroll. I don't need to remember when I can see everything. It separates design from implementation. That is a big deal when you get into large software projects, okay? This is the design. Now, of course, there's a little bit of implementation in the actual declarations, right? But this is basically the design of the class. And then in the CPP file, we would have the implementation of the class. So we know that two vectors can be added together and they give us a new vector, but how does it work? How does it do it? Well, if you wanna know how, you go to the CPP file. And the cool thing is that headers seldom change leading to less files being recompiled, okay? So that would mean that once we get the, the declarations down for our class, if the implementation ever changes, and this is such a low level detail that you probably won't get unless you've done a lot of C++ already, but basically by separating things into headers and CPP files, since declarations very rarely change, but implementations frequently change, then we are recompiling fewer files because the files are going to be including this header. So just, just a bit hand wavy. All right, the drawbacks of header files. More files in your code base, right? Despite what some would have you believe, more files is always worse than fewer files. Now, I'm talking about that purely in terms of files. Of course, if you have one two million line file, that's horrendous. That is not necessarily better than having 
uh, 20 100,000 line files, right? I'm not saying that a one file program is always what you want, but of course, having more files is just harder to manage, right? So if you view more files as a drawback, then of course that's a drawback. And what that means is that it can be a little bit annoying tabbing back and forth between header files and CPP files and stuff, but you get used to it. Cyclic dependencies can be hard to detect and resolve. So a cyclic dependency, we will be avoiding them in this course, but just be aware that when you do your own C++, let's say you have a class A and a class B. If class A stores a class B and class B stores a class A, that's a cyclic dependency. So if one class de um, depends on another class and the other class depends on it, sometimes that can happen. So for example, let's say um, you have a student class and a course class. So you're writing some data management system for the university, right? Your student class might want to keep a list of courses the student is taking, right? So you've got a list of courses. However, your course class may want to keep a list of students that are taking the course, right? And so there are little tricks and stuff that you can use in C++ to resolve these cyclic dependencies. We're not going to get into that because we're not going, I'm teaching you just enough to, to learn, to, to be able to do this course. So just be aware that that can happen. Okay. Some people say that that only happens due to bad design, but I say that's not true. Usually it's because of bad design, but there are some times when it is unavoidable that you need to have references back and forth. All right. Then we get into things like forward declarations and, okay, we're not going to be going that far. All right. So here's another diagram. We've already talked about this. Every file goes into .o file and then gets linked together. All right. Primitives. You all know these. You've all done Java or some other thing. There's, there's a bunch of different types, right? Um, I'm not going to go into them all. This is just for your own reference. Um, different arithmetic operators. Um, so things that may not be in other languages. So for example, integers have this uh, modulus um, remainder, integer division. Um, you can add and subtract. You can pre-increment or post-increment. Uh, pre-decrement or post-decrement. This, this subtracts one from a number. This adds one to a number. Um, we've got bitwise operators. We may get into bitwise stuff. That's really cool later. Um, that may not be in other programming languages. Uh, don't worry if you don't remember all that. Okay? I don't remember all that stuff all the time. You're not going to remember all that stuff all the time. You're going to be Googling stuff. And I know that in the first lecture, I went on this huge tangent about, um, like, don't, Google stuff. Well, you're going to Google stuff. Like you need to, you know, you're going to remember syntax. Just don't Google solutions to the assignment. That's what I'm trying to say. Functions. Um, we've got a return type, then a function name, then some arguments, and then some logic. It's basically the same thing as Java. Um, we can have the same function names with different input arguments, but you can't have functions with the same name that only differ in return type. Okay. So just keep that in mind. C++ classes. Here is the, um, the syntax for declaring a class. So we have a class point. Um, the, um, sorry, let me get my thoughts. This is how you declare a class. You say class and then the class name. Then you encapsulate the class in brackets and you have to end with a semicolon. How many times have I forgotten that semicolon? It's crazy. Um, so here would be the header file contents, the declarations of my class point. Um, I've got two variables here. My class point is going to have an X and a Y because a point in space is an X and Y location. Anything that you do not declare the scope of is by default private. So the way the syntax I like to use is I'm going to say public down here and everything that's public is below that and anything above that is private. What some people do is declare public variables first and then specifically declare private variables later. It doesn't matter. It's just style. Okay. So this is less typing. So that's what I do. And in this course, I am using, I can't remember what the name of this is, but um, the syntax where this M underscore. So this, this is the X variable, right? In my class, 
m underscore refers to a private member variable. So wherever you are in your code, you know that, oh, this variable is a private member variable. Can't remember what the exact name of this, this style is, but it doesn't matter. We're just using it, okay? So if this is the, and, and you'll see why that matters later and why local variables, yeah, it might be Hungarian nota notation, someone in the chat just said. So this might be Hungarian notation, um, but it allows you to tell the difference between locals, locally scoped variables and um, class scoped variables. All right, so this is the declaration. Somewhere in the CPP file, I would have the implementation. Here is how you do a constructor. So I would have a point class. I would say point, the point constructor, the input variables to the constructor, and then I would say, oh, I'm going to set my private member variable of X equal to the input variable of X and the private member variable of Y equal to the input variable of Y. Now, C++ has a cool way of doing this. Um, this, it may not look like it, but this is an inefficient way of doing this. The reason for that is because whenever you call the point constructor, whenever you call any pointer or any constructor in C++, all of the member variables are given their default values, right? So here, if I did a constructor like this, I would have a constructor called point, and as soon as I got into the code, the X and the Y would be given their default value of zero, which takes some amount of time, some amount of cycles. And then by doing this, I would be overwriting those default values of zero with the X and the Y, okay? Now for integers, this doesn't make a huge difference, but for some things, for some larger data types, it would make a big difference. And for the amount of points that you're creating, you're essentially doing double the work here because it's, it's giving the default values of zero, then it's overwriting with X and Y. So what we want to do is the syntax called an initializer list. And an initializer list has a weird syntax if you come from other programming languages, but essentially after the point um, constructor is declared, you have a semicolon. And just remember all of this white space is me. The white space doesn't matter. You could have this come right after it or all on this line or spaced out. This is all just white space, but I find this, this white space is, is easier to mentally process. This initializer list says that even before we get to the code of this, set up these variables. So mx gets the value of x, my gets the, gets the value of y, and they will never be given that default value of zero with the initializer list, so we've cut out half of the assignments, okay? It's such a small detail, but just realize that that is what you will be seeing in this course is this initializer list because it's it's the most efficient way, it's the correct way to do it. Also, something to realize is that if these private member vari variables were const, meaning constant, they can't change, then if that was const, this would throw a compiler error because you cannot set the value of a const member variable. However, you can set the value of const member variables using initializer lists. So wherever you want to have a const member variable set via the, the constructor, you have to use initializer lists. And then of course, we have a destructor as well. And anything you would want to do cleanup, maybe you had some pointers in the class, you want to delete the pointers, whatever you would have here. Quickly, we'll talk about uh, the STL. There are very commonly used containers in the STL, standard vector uh, of type T. Um, the all, so there's some, I don't even know why I have this here. So standard vector of t, so for, for, for example, you can have a vector of ints, a vector of floats, a vector of any custom data type as long as it has a default constructor. You can have a set, this is an ordered set, so it, it ha makes sure there's only one of something in a set. You can also have a map, so you can have a map of strings to ints or whatever you want. Here is some, um, here's a reference for like how to use a vector. I'm actually gonna do some live coding, so I, I'll just leave this here for you. It's in the notes. I'll show you how to do this in the live coding. All right, so officially our time is up for the class, okay? But because this is like, I want to give you the best education possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do some live coding now. 
So if you want to come back later, if you have another class, I completely understand if you're watching this live. Um, the cool thing about watching um, lectures that are recorded is that you can watch them at double speed. I'm not done. This is not the end of the class. I am actually going to do a bunch of live coding now. So for people who are very new to C++, I just want you to give, to give you as much information and as much teaching as possible. So what we are going to do now is we're gonna do some live coding. And like I said before, I have not practiced this beforehand, so we'll see how this goes, okay? Um, so let's get started with some live coding. Now, I'm going to be doing this live coding in the terminal. In uh, The reason I am doing that is because it's just easier for me, I'm really used to it, and for the purposes of what I want to show you, it's, it's the best thing to do, okay? So I'm in the terminal here. I'm going to be using Vim to show you some things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, Vim lecture 2cpp and this is going to open up a new file called lecture2.cpp and we're going to just do some coding in C++. So I realize that this lecture is long, but it's, it's for your benefit. It's, there's no textbook, so just watch this if you want to. You don't, have, you don't absolutely have to keep watching, but if you're new to C++, this might be pretty fun. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to type in our... Um, oh, and by the way, if you want to follow along, if you are a student at the university, um, the way that I am doing this through a terminal on Windows is I'm using a program called PuTTY. You can also use um, Windows Terminal. You can SSH into our department. So using your CS username and password, you can SSH to garfield.cs.mon.ca. So P-U-T-T-Y, putty. Um, and then you type in your username and password and you get this exact terminal. It has a C compiler. So you can do exactly what I'm doing from Windows if you want to practice your C++. So we are going to include IOStream. And I'm typing all this from memory. So give me a little break. If I make some mistakes, we're gonna make the mistakes together and it'll be fun. All right. So I've got int main, right? I gotta type that in. I've got my int argc, my char star argv, and then I've got my, um, let's see here. I've got a microphone between me and my keyboard, so it's a little hard to type. So we are going to return zero. And up here, we are going to do standard cout hello world and then I'm going to do standard ENDL. So I know we didn't do this in the slides, but it turns out annoyingly different operating systems have different new line carriage return characters. So typically you would just type a slash N, but if you just type slash N and then you open it up in Windows Notepad, there will be no new line. It's really annoying. And so what this standard ENDL is, is this compiler is built for this specific operating system. And so it will know the special end line character. So what we have to do here is I'm gonna exit out. So right quit. And then I'm gonna type G++ um, dash standard equals C++ 17. That is the standard that we are using for this course lecture2.cpp and then unfortunately my head is in the way but oh so it's just going to this is going to compile and it's going to go to a.out okay so it's compiling and now if i run dot slash that's the run a.out it's going to say hello world all right now if i wanted to compile to my own program i would say dash o oh, let me uh one second let me make a few new lines so my head isn't in the way. I would say dash O uh, lecture, lecture code or something like that, right? And it would compile it to that. And then I would say dot slash lecture code and it, it would run the same way, all right? Now, it's gonna be really tedious for me to have to exit out of Vim, retype everything every single time. So what I've done is um, I'm just going to go back into the lecture code. I have a, a macro in Vim which does that. 
So I have a macro in Vim. I just hit uh, control B is my macro. What it does is when I hit that button, it will save the file. It will compile the file. If there is an error, it will show me the error. If there is no error, it will run the program. Okay. So from within Vim, if I just hit my macro, it'll, it'll compile it and run it. So that's what we'll be doing from now on. But just realize that, um, you know, if you don't have that macro set up, you'll just be typing in G plus plus, whatever. I just have that, um, set up here. So there you go. Uh, so if I do type an error in here, so for example, if I type in clout instead of C out, and then I do that, what will happen? All right. So here is your first uh, C++ error. Um, my head's in the way, but I'm not going to move that, unfortunately. So it says, in function int main, here's an error. Clout is not a member of standard. Because I said standard colon colon C out. And it says, up here where you can't see, it says, did you mean C out? <laughs> and so it says that, right? So it suggests change clout to C out, right? So I do that. I change clout C out, I recompile, and it works. All right. So sometimes the C++ compiler is very useful. Sometimes it is not very useful. Um, all right. So let's do something a little bit uh, more complex than this. Let's, uh, let's do some int variables. All right. So I've got int, um, int a equals 42, int b equals 10. All right. So how would I print out some integers to the screen? Well, the cool thing is I can just type out A and then maybe a space between them and B, right? So anytime I want to type a new thing, I just pipe it back in. So everything gets piped into C out. I compile and run. I get 42 and 10. If I wanted to say do some math here, then I can say plus and put that in parentheses. And then that should print out, well, what? Okay, 52 right now let's say uh let's erase this and let's say all right int age equals 39 because that is how old i am now let's you know i could do doubles and straight floats and all that kind of stuff you know all about that let's use standard string so strand standard string uh first name i'm going to say that that's dave and standard string uh, last name, that's going to be Churchill, right? Okay. Oops. I've been using, I've been programming too much, uh, Python recently. So I got the single quote disease. All right. So I'm going to print out, uh, first, and then I'm going to print out a space and then I'm going to print out last. All right. Let's see what this says. There we go. Dave Churchill. If I want to have a string, standard string name, then I could say, this is first plus a space plus Churchill. So we can, or not <laughs> first plus last, sorry. And then down here, I could just print out name because modern C++ lets us add strings together. It's pretty neat, right? We're not messing around with chance, char star, uh, etc. cetera. Um, all right. So let's say now, here is something you're going to hear or see online, all right? You're going to see this using namespace standard. What this tells the compiler, this is, a, this is a contentious topic. What this tells the compiler is that we are going to be assuming that we're using stuff from standard. So if there's ever anything that I type that you don't recognize, assume that it comes from standard. What that means is when I have using namespace standard, I can do this. Okay. So I don't need to put standard in front of everything. People like that. People like not having to type that. If I come up here now and I erase that and I compile again, it says C out was not declared in this scope. Uh, I don't know what a string is. Oh my God, what's happening? And it's because it doesn't know that it's the standard version, right? So in this course, we are not going to be using namespace standard. I know that it's a couple of more characters to type, 
but I prefer it because it's more verbose and it says exactly what we're doing, okay? So we are not typing using namespace standard in this course. If you do, we'll ding you a few marks on the assignment. Okay, now what we're gonna do is let's use a data structure, okay? Let's use a vector. So how would we use a vector? Um, let me delete everything I have here. Let's say, all right, I'm going to have a standard vector of integers, right? A standard vector of ints, I'm going to call this uh, my, my vec. There we go. So I have declared a standard vector of integers. Now, in order to add something to a vector, I would say vec.pushback because you're pushing it to the back of the vector. Vector is a queue data structure, right? Sorry, it's a stack, I guess, with push and pop. Ignore that. It's not a queue. It's not a stack. It's just a vector. So we're going to push back 42 vec.push uh, back. Ah. Uh, 10. We're going to do what we did before. Now, I could say standard C out vec zero, right? and then maybe a new line character. I'll be lazy and just do that. And now I'll copy and paste that and I'll say vec one. All right, now let's see what this does. Okay, so it printed the first thing in the vector and then it printed the second thing in the vector. Now you might be saying, Ooh, what if we said vec two? Cause in Java, we'll get a uh, array out of bounds error for this. Let's see what happens. Uh oh. But the the vector isn't that long. So what's happening? Here is where C++ gets very interesting. You're on your own when it comes to vectors, okay? When it comes to arrays and vectors, if you go beyond the scope of a vector, unless you're running in debug mode, you're just getting whatever happens to be in memory at that location. So be very careful when you do that. Now, if I had 30 things in my vector, I'm not gonna want to have to write like an, a specific print statement for everything in the vector. So let's talk about how we go through the vector, all right? So there's, there's a few different ways to iterate through containers in C++. We could do the standard thing where we go for um, int i equals zero, i less than vec dot size i plus plus, and then we can say um, standard C out, oh geez, I keep typing that. Vec i, and then a new line. Okay, so let's see what happens here. All right, so it did work. It did work, but it gave us an, an, a warning. So there are warnings and errors. Let's see what the warnings said. It said, warning, comparison of integer expressions of different signedness, int and size type AKA unsigned int or long unsigned int. So what that warning told me is that the vector size is an unsigned integer and the integer i is a signed integer. So if you store, you know, you're all familiar, you're fourth year computer science students, there could be some error in the logic if I'm comparing signed integer and unsigned integers. So whenever I'm doing a loop through a vector, I'm going to use a size type or a size T. On different system, this, this size T is essentially a long unsigned int. However, size T is what you what is safe to use because it will, on a 32-bit system, it will be 32 bits. On a 64-bit system, it will be 64 bits. So now I can do this and there's no more warning. Okay, so just a rule of thumb is whenever you're iterating through a vector, its size is going to be of type unsigned, so use unsigned, all right? Now, if I add another thing to this, of course, it's gonna loop through my vector and it's gonna print all three things, okay? There's another way to do this, um, and that is a range-based for loop. So I can say for, um, now I need the type that's in my vector, Right, so I'm gonna say for, uh, this is int, int a in vec standard c out a and a new line. So what this does 
is it says, for everything in the vector, assign it the name of A, and then I can do something with it. All right, so let's look at that. And it did it. So it printed out the first thing the first time, and then the second thing the second time. However, let's try this now. So if I delete this, and I go up and I make this a float vector, and I make these floats, so I'm just going to clear them as actual floats. Now what happens is I'm taking the vector, I'm converting everything in the vector to an integer and then I'm printing it, right? And so be careful when you do that. So there's a really cool thing that you can do in modern C++ is the auto keyword. The auto keyword is going to say, hey, whatever type that is, make it that type. So even though it's a signed or it's a, it's a statically typed language, I could either say float A equals vec one, or I could say auto A equals vec1. And what auto will do is the, the square bracket operator for vector, the compiler knows it's going to be returning a float, so it just types it in there for me, okay? So here, now what will happen is it'll actually print out the float, right? Because this says for whatever happens to be in the vector, it does type inference on that. Okay, someone just type type inference the same time I say it. So it looks up what type it should be, infers it, and does it for you. All right? Now, be very careful about this because doing it this way will copy the thing in the vector. For a floating point or an integer, this doesn't matter that much because you're just copying an int. However, if this was a big long string, okay, or if this was a big data structure, this is copying that. So I'm not going to get into this now. I'm going to get into this more in the next lecture, but we can use a reference here, right? So we can use, okay, this is a reference. So we're just pointing to it. And so it'll produce the same result, but less copies. All right. So that, that was a bit hand wavy. We'll talk about that next time. All right. What I want to do now is let's make our first class. Okay, so I know I said that if you make classes, what you should do is you should put them in their own H file and then include the H file, but that's gonna be a lot of work for me when I'm just doing it here. So let's, let's just do it all in the one file, okay? So let's make a class called student. Class student. There, we've created a class. Tell me a language where you can make a class faster than that. People say C++ is hard. That's the easiest way to declare a class I've ever seen. Okay, so um, in this class, we're gonna have some public stuff and we're gonna have some private stuff. So let's say um, the public stuff is gonna be down there. The private stuff's gonna be up here. So let's say we're gonna have a standard string, uh, first name. Okay, so I'm just gonna say first, standard string, last. What else can a student have? Um, maybe they're going to have a student ID. Maybe that's going to be an integer, right? So int uh, ID equals uh, zero. We'll give it a default value. Okay, strings get default values on their own, but we can say, okay, um, maybe this is um, first and this is last, right? So we can give things default values within the declaration of the class, which old C++ couldn't do. Uh, maybe also we have something like float uh, average. So this is their grade average, right? So just something to uh, say, okay, that's what it is. Now I'm gonna uh, line all these up because I like, I like doing that. I find it a bit more readable. So there we go. So there's our class definition. Nice use of white space, right? This is where the white space comes in. And um, even sometimes I'll do something like this, where I have the type, and then I'll do like this. Um, I know some people don't like this. I like this in certain situations, not in other situations, because you can see all the types in one column, all the names in another column, all the variables, like all the default values in another column. White space doesn't matter. 
It's just up to you how you prefer to look at things, okay? So those are the private things. Now, what's a function that we're gonna need for this? Well, we're gonna need a constructor, right? So a constructor, maybe the constructor is going to take in, let's just say that the constructor takes in everything. Actually, let's first give it a default constructor. Um, so you like to give things a default constructor just to say, okay, if I ever construct a student with no arguments, what's going to happen? And in this case, nothing's going to happen because um, I've already got default stuff up here. So that is what's called a default constructor. And if I just say student S, that's what it's going to be, all right? So now let's make a, a slightly better constructor. Let's say we're going to pass in a string, which is the first name. We're going to pass in a string, which is the last name, and then an int ID and a float average. Okay, that all fits on my screen. That's excellent. All right, so what are we gonna do down here? Well, let's actually use the, um, the initializer list right away. So I could type it all in the body of the constructor and then erase it, but in the interest of time, let's just use the initializer list. So our private member variable first, m underscore first, is gonna get the same value that was in first. m last is gonna get the value that was in last. And the same thing for the integers, m id is gonna get the value that was in id. And uh, m average is gonna get the value that was in average. Sometimes I like doing this. because white space doesn't matter, lines it up a bit nicer, just reducing that cognitive load, right? Sometimes you can't do that, it's okay, but that is our, um, our student constructor. We could have many different constructors in many different ways, but let's just leave it at that for now. And now, of course, we've got our data encapsulation up here and all that kind of stuff. Let's say we want um, to get the student's first name, right? So we would have, or let's let's say we want to get their average. So I would have a function, int is what it's going to be returned. This is get average. It has no arguments to it. And what it's going to do is it's going to return the average. So if we ever want to get the student's average, we can have get average. We're going to have the same thing, uh, get ID return M ID right? Uh, we're going to have the same thing for uh, standard string. Uh, let's say get first and return m first. Uh, I see a bunch of people out there saying hello in the chat. Hello. We are doing our intro class on C++ and I'm doing some live coding. Get last. And here is our last name return m last. So I see a bunch of people giving me tips. Trust me, we're on a journey here. We're gonna to get to all of those things. So what we have now is we have private member variables for all the data that you would want to have as a student and then public, public functions to get all of those things. So let's make some students. All right, let's make some students. Um, all right. So here we are going to have student S1. And we are just gonna use the default constructor for student S1. We're gonna see what happens. Then I'm gonna make uh, student S2. That student is going to be Dave. His last name is going to be Churchill. His student ID is going to be uh, one because I'm very old. And my average is going to be uh, pi because I'm very dumb, right? And we'll make one more student, call this S3. This is going to be uh, Jane uh, Doe, who's going to have a student ID of 2022 uh, 0001. So Jane registered for classes this year and their average is a 99.9 .9 because uh, Jane is a smarty pants, all right? So we've created some students. Let's compile now and see what happens. Now. It's very important to like, you wouldn't want to write a whole program and then test it for the first time. 
You want to do a little bit of functionality a little bit at a time. So now that we've written our class and we've written something to test the class, that's a good time to compile for the first time. All right, no compilation errors. That is very good. So what we could do is I could say here, standard C out um, S3 dot get last. Perfect. So what this should print out is S3 get last, that's the last name. So ideally this is gonna print out do. Perfect, okay, so I've got a bunch of students. I've got their information in there. Now I can use it. However, it's gonna get a bit tedious to print out all their stuff, right? One, like one variable at a time. So what I'm gonna do here um, is I'm going to make a void function. And that void function is not gonna return anything because this is gonna just be called print. And I'm just going to be printing out stuff, okay? So what am I gonna print here? Let's print all of the students' information. So I can say standard C out uh, M first, then a space, then M last, and then a space, and then ID, and then a space. Uh, actually, let me do this in a couple of lines so that it's not going off the side. M ID and a space, and then M average. And then I will have a new line. Perfect. So now down here, instead of using standard C out, I can say s3.print, and here we go. Jane Doe, their student number, and their average, okay? So that's, you know, this is all standard first and second year stuff. I'm just showing you the C++ syntax for all of this. Perfect. Okay, so now let's say that I wanted to have, and this is going to be important in our course, okay? I'm going to have a const student. That means that I'm gonna set up this student object and I never want that student object to change, okay? So this looks fine. I set up a const student and then I print it out. When I go to compile this, I get an error, okay? And it says, passing const student as this arguments discards qualifiers. Now, what the hell does that mean? It means the following. I have a const student that I am calling a function on, okay? But that function could change the student, right? So I have a student that I want to be const, but I am calling a function on it. So what I have to do is I have to declare this function as const, okay? So once I declare this function as const, now it's fine. Because this means I have a function called print that will never ever change the object. And if I try to change the object, so let's say in here I try and be sneaky and I say m first equals uh, Joe. So if I try and change the variables of the object from within a const object or a const function, oh my God, what happened, right? That's where C++ errors get kind of bad. So, but that whole thing basically just said, don't try and change the, the, the object from within a const function. So what that means is that if I wanted to, for example, uh, call s3.getLast, which is just returning the last name, right? I can't call that on a const because these functions are not const. So what I have to do up here is call const. So each of these functions, where I'm every single function I have on a class, where I am not changing the class, I should mark them as const, okay? That's just good practice. It is called const correctness. So anywhere you have a function that is not changing the internals of the class, um, call it, as, or sorry, declare it as const so that you can use that function on const member variables. It's called const correctness. It might seem a little bit anal, but it's, it's what you wanna do. Okay, now watch this. Uh, no, I think I'll get this into the, no, I'm getting into this next lecture. So really what you want to do here is be returning references to these things. 
I understand this is the first lecture of C++. So if you're out there saying that, oh, he's copying strings, blah, blah, blah. I get into all of that in lecture number two. Okay, this is all just for, for show. All right, let's do one more thing before we go because I know I'm going long, but I'm just giving this for people who, who want the extra stuff. Let's make a course object, okay? Someone said, when would you ever want to make use of a constant instance of a class? Use constant variables or structs. Um, nope, a lot of the time you would want to make a const class. The, um, the canonical example of when you would want to make use of a const class is as follows. Um, so let's say we want to say uh, do machine learning. Okay, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but I want to I want to show a good example of this. So let's say we want to do do some machine learning with a, an object called data, and that data is really big. Okay, so this is my data. What I want to do is if I just pass in data, and again, I'm doing this in the next lecture, C and C++ are passed by value. So I would be copying this huge data structure here, right? So what I want to do is either pass it by a reference or by a pointer, right? Typically by a reference because it's a little bit safer. And then since that's a reference, I actually don't want this function to be able to change my data. I just want it to do the learning on the data, right? So I want to mark that as const so that I am 100% sure that this function will not change the input variable, right? And so in this case, if I have a const reference to data and I call data.getValue, right? If getValue is not marked as const, then I won't be able to do that. So there are lots of examples of, of where we need to access const data, okay? Or const, um, const classes. And that will come up many, many times in this course and I'll get back into that. All right, so enough, enough of that. Let me get on with what I wanted to do for the rest of this course. Jeez. Okay, so let's make a, now we're gonna make a class called course. What is that course going to, to have? Well, the course is going to have a standard string and that is going to be the name of the course. Um, we're just gonna call it course by default so that we, you know, it doesn't have a name. Um, and we're also going to have a standard vector of student objects called M students. So that is going to be the context of our course. It's going to have a name, Comp 4300, it's going to have a list of students in, in that, okay. Um, so for people asking out there that they didn't get that data example, tune into the next lecture and you will see it. Or look at the rest of the class when we want to, for example, draw a sprite. That sprite is going to be a class and we're not gonna to wanna to change it, so we're gonna want it to be const. You'll have to trust me that there are countless examples of where that is useful, all right. So back to the back to the last thing I want to do. Um, so as public for the course, we're of course going to have a course private constructor, or sorry, uh, a, a default constructor. And we're also going to have a course which takes a standard string name as a constructor, right? The course is going to have a name and we are going to use an initializer list to say that the name of the course is going to get the value of name. Now, again, I know I should be passing these by references. We're gonna talk about that in the next class. All right. But let's just talk about it now, okay? Strings are big things, okay? There are very few, if ever, any examples where this would be correct. Because again, what this would be doing in C++ is copying the string name into this constructor. So what we want to do is pass a reference to a string. We'll talk about references next time. And then because it's now a reference, we could actually change the name, which we don't want to happen. And so we want to pass a const reference to that, okay? So a lot of the time, whenever you're passing strings around in C++, you want to pass const references to strings and not strings themselves. So this is going to be more correct. 
Okie dokie. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have um, a, well, we want a way to add students to the class, right? So let's do a void add student. And then we will add a student S into the class. All right. And again, we don't want to copy this student. So for just now, I'm going to say we are going to be passing a const reference to a student, which you will understand in the next lecture. So I know that like people teach C++ in different ways. Some people would say, don't, don't write something on the screen that they don't understand. I'm not, a, you can, you can drive a car before you know how a car works, right? So we're just going to write this for now. And then next class, we're going to explain what it means. And how would I add that? Well, I'm going to add that to my students vector by saying push back S. All right. So now that student will be added to my students vector. All right. How would I get my students? Well, um, I'm going to write a function that gets the students. Well, what am I going to be returning in that function? Standard vector student. So that's the return type of the function get students, which has no argument, which is const because we're not changing anything. Up here, add student is not const because we cannot add students. Right? Or sorry, um, we can't add anything if it was const. And since we want to add things, it's not const. This here is going to return um, the students array. Done. However, again, C is passed by value. So the return type would actually copy this big vector of students. So what we want to do again is return a reference to it. And since we don't want it to change, then this is going to be const. So this is one of the annoying things about C++ is that const can appear in three different places. At the beginning of a function, at the end of a function, and at the beginning of a variable. So this const means that this function will not change the class. This const means that whatever we're returning cannot be changed. That's what that means, okay? Const correctness is important, and we'll see why once we get into the course. All right, so now we've got a way to add students, and we've got a way to get students. Now what we're going to do is let's add a way, let, let's make another print function. So let's uh, say void print. This is going to be const because we don't want the, the class to change. We're just accessing values and printing them. And what we can do is let's use that range-based for loop. So for auto, or auto s in m students. So we know what that means now. It says use type inference. This is actually a student, right? So I, can, I could say for student s in students, but it's a good idea to use auto where we can. So for every student s in the students array, let's use the print function of the students, and I guess I should, you know, let's go const auto s, so that it's not going to be changed. Um, for every student in the vector, let's print it out. All right, let's see, do I compile? I do not compile, oh, because I, I had this uh, example here somewhere. Where do I have that? Probably down here. We'll find it in a second. Oh yeah, so this doesn't work anymore. Um, all right, so now what I wanna do Someone said it looks like I can paste const anywhere. I know. Um, so people out there are asking what the ampersand is. That is called a reference. And I am very briefly explaining it here, but I am going to explain it in excruciating detail in the next lecture. So please tune in to lecture three, which is the second part of C++. We'll be talking about pointers and references in memory. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's create a course. So now I have a course. Let's call that course comp 4300. We're going to um, have a name, which is comp 4300. And what I'm going to do is say comp 4300.add student. And that's going to be student S1. And then I can copy and paste this. And I'm going to add student S2, student S3. And watch this. I can actually do this as well dot add student, and then let me make a new student here. 
And this student is uh, Billy. Their last name is Bob. Uh, their student name is three, or their student ID is three, and their average is uh, 50. Boom. All right. Now down here, comp4300.print. Hopefully this works. Oh, I've got an error. Okay. So I've got mstudent.pushbacks. Okay, so it says mstudent was not declared in this scope. That is on uh, line 68. So let's look at nine, line 68. Um, in, I can type this, go to line 68. Oh, that's supposed to be mstudents. So you all failed. It was You were supposed to catch that error. I did that on purpose, right? Okay, let's try and compile again. Okay, uh, again, we've got M student on line 63. So here we go. Oh, there we go. And it worked. So we created some student objects. We added some student objects to our course object. And now we have this, this functional system in C++ and just a few lines of code. Like, could you reasonably write that in any other programming language as quickly? I mean, you couldn't do it faster, probably. All right, so let's do something interesting. For the last thing I wanna do in this course is I wanna show you file input, okay? Because we're only using that a lot in this course. So you can use that. Uh, I want to add a function to my course, which loads student information from file, okay? Um, I would recommend students in the class to not take a lot of advice from chat because sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. I will eventually get to it. All right. So let's make this function load from file. We're going to have a standard string uh, file name. And this function is not const because we are going to be loading the class from a file. Okay. So. In order to do this, the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to include the tools to let us work with a file. And that is the file stream tools. All right. So let's do that. Sorry, I just have to close this notification over here. All righty. The second thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to have a list of students in the class. I've already made one of those. So if I just cat students.txt, here we go. So I've got a bunch of uh, students in the same format in this file that I've already written, all right? So first name, last name, student ID, average. And then we go to the next line and we do student, last name, ID, average. And you might say, oh my God, I've heard of file reading in C and C++. It's so annoying. It's so verbose. Just watch, just, just you watch. I will challenge anyone to do what I'm about to do in any other programming language in fewer lines of code, okay? It'll, without writing libraries and then calling that, you know? So that is my student data. It's in a file called students.txt, and that is what I am going to read. So down here, what I'm going to have in my um, main function, instead of declaring all these students, is I'm going to have, all right, so I'm going to have my uh, course. Uh, I'm going to call that course C. That is going to be comp 4300. And then I'm going to C dot load from file. And that's going to be students dot text. All right, let's compile and run. Okay, there's no compiler errors, but it doesn't do anything because our load from file thing doesn't happen yet, right? Oh, now, sorry, actually I didn't print. So C dot print. That's going to print all the students in the course. And again, we haven't actually loaded anything yet, so it won't print anything. But we know our printing function works because we tested it before, right? All right, so how will we load from file? Well, it turns out that in order to load something from a file, we need a file input stream. So streams in C++ are so nice. They do things for us really, really easily. So watch this, standard because the input file stream class is within the sta namespace standard. It's an IF stream, which stands for input file stream. I'm gonna call this variable 
f in for file in, and then the constructor, I give it the file name. Bam. Look at that. That's crazy. Now watch this. While, um, okay, sorry. Let's say I want to read all of the string tokens from a file. How would I, uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, someone pointed that out. Someone's paying attention. Great job. So let's say I want to load in all of the different string tokens from a file and just print them to the stream, print them to the screen, sorry. So what I can do, I'm going to have a standard string. I'm going to call this temp, okay? So this is my temporary variable that I'm going to read things into. And I'm going to say while f in temp. So remember when we had standard c out? So standard c out, was the opposite direction. We are using a stream, right? So this string is getting sent into standard C out. If we do the opposite thing, we can read data, even from files. So F in is going to send its next string token into temp. Watch this. And if there are no more tokens, this loop will no longer run and it will exit. So let's say while f in to temp standard c out temp and then a new line. So it's just going through the file, reading everything and printing it out. Look at that. So every individual token. So some people are asking, what is a token? Tokens can mean different things, but essentially a token is a string that is separated by some white space or by new lines, okay? So in C++, I can get the next token by just using this operator. This just says, get the next string that's not white space and it's not a new line character and put it into temp for me. Super crazy cool. All right, now I'm gonna need some things in order to read in the first name, the last name, uh, the ID and the grade of a student, right? So let's say instead of temp, I have the first name and the last name. So I've got two strings now, one is called first, one is called last. And then I'm gonna have an int called ID and I'm gonna have a float called average. So now what happens is I can say while, so what is my while loop here? Well, the first name is the first thing on a line, right? So I can say, while I have a valid first name as the next token, what I can do is, okay, now my first name is stored in first, all right? I can say F in, so read the next token, which is the last name, into last. Read the next token into ID. The next token will automatically be converted into an integer for me. It's crazy how cool that is, right? So like the C++ file reading stream will automatically convert it into an int. Now, if it's not an int, it'll throw an error. And then the last one will will send it to the float, or sorry, not to float, to average. So on each line, it says, while I have a valid first line character, read in the first, read in the first name, then read in the last name, read in the ID, read in the average. I, that's pretty quick, but not only that, remember when we had um, standard C out, uh, hello, and then we can give it another thing, and then we can give it another thing like this. We can do the same thing with the input version. So I can say F in, sorry, fixing my white space, F in last ID average. So, this literally reads in everything for me. And if this is true, now I can create my student object, right? So let me create it in place. So I'm already in my, my, my course class because it's been a while. Let's look at that. We're inside our course class. So what do I want to do with this information now that I have it? Well, I want to add student, sorry, 
add student. And now I've successfully read everything in. So I can just read in first. Uh, sorry, I need to construct the student. First, last, ID, average. That's it. This is the entire function that loads all of those students from the file, stops at the end of the file, converts everything to integers and floats. Show me another programming language that could do that that easy. Seriously. Right? People make fun of C++. But there it is. I loaded all of that information from the file, stored it in the student class, and then printed it out. Someone said Python. I challenge you to write that in fewer lines of code in Python. Just go do it. Go do it. it. You will not be able to, like, you'd probably do it in the exact same amount of lines, right? But not fewer. Uh, all right. So, here we go. We have created a course, loaded the data from a file, printed that data out. In this course, every single game that we make is going to have a configuration file in which, if I load that, So the configuration file for all of our games in this course are going to look something like this. And so you've got to write the code to be able to parse in that stuff. And so what you're going to do is you're going to write code kind of like this. All right, where you say, okay, I'm going to parse something in and I'm going to do something with that. So feel free to just copy and paste this and, and use that for your, for your classwork. All right, I know I went like an hour over time for this lecture, but again, it was like, I don't have a textbook, so I just wanna give you this supplemental material. This is all just me helping you out with C++, so I hope you didn't mind too much. Um, uh, someone asked, Python has fewer lines for general stuff, but it's complicated things like making games C++ is better. No, 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 it's not like that where one is better than the other. The only thing I was trying to say was that People are generally afraid of using C++ because they think things are too difficult. What I'm telling you is that modern C++ is very, very concise and very powerful for certain things that we're going to be using in this course. So don't be afraid of it. This was two lines, sorry, three lines for reading in the whole file and adding the students, okay? I will put this code on D2L so students can access it. If you are not a student in the class, just, just watch it and type it out yourself, okay? So thank you so much for tuning in, um, for tuning into the lecture. I know this one went late, but I hope you appreciate the C++. All right, great. Well, that's it for me. Um, I will see you on Tuesday when we are doing more C++. Um, actually, let me just go back to here. So on uh, next Tuesday, we are going to be doing more C++ and then we'll finally get into our assignment. Uh, let me answer some questions that I have in the chat. Um, uh, someone out there who has been giving good feedback said that there's no better language. That is exactly true. Uh, the analogy that I use as they have given is that programming languages are tools. And so if you walked up to someone building a house or a carpenter or a construction worker and said, what's the best tool? They'd, they'd think you were crazy. Like one construction worker is, is, is arguing that a hammer is the best tool. And another one is arguing that a saw is the best tool. Like when you phrase it like that, there is no best programming language. Programming languages are capable of doing specific things in specific ways and ha they have certain properties. Either they're easier to use they're, they're faster, like they're more verbose. So you just choose the one that's like, they're supported more or less. Basically what will happen is in your life is that you'll get a job. That job will force you to use a language. That's, that's the extent of the argument, right? Is that we're, we're using this language. If you don't, you don't have the job, right? So don't worry about good or bad languages. They're all good and bad in, in their own ways. Um, Someone said, is there a difference between standard IF stream and the F stream library? So the F stream library includes as the library IF stream. There is also OF stream, which would print out to a file. So IF stream is input file stream. 
OF stream is output file stream. There are also other things that are included with the F stream include, but that is what you have to include in order to use IF stream. Someone asked, are we going to get in touch with rendering APIs in this course? Um, so in this course, all of our rendering will consist of using the library called SFML, which we are going to get into in lecture number four. So in this class, we are not super concerned with rendering um, because the library we are going to be using for it is fairly efficient. Um, the library uses OpenGL under the hood, so it will all be GPU rendering. When we get later on into the course, I will actually be talking about shaders. So we will be talking about GPU uh, rendering and shaders, but um, basically for almost the entirety of the course, we're gonna be letting this API doing the rendering for us. We will talk about it, but this course is not a rendering course and it's very easy for a games programming course to turn into a rendering and graphics course. And that's, I, I'm intentionally avoiding that. Um, someone said, is the standard, is, is standard API provided by the OS? It's provided by the compiler. So if you install um, the G, G++ compiler, it will come with um, whatever version of, um, of C++ it supports. So for example, the current compilers will support C++ 20. It will come with the standard template library, which has all of the functionality up to the latest version that it supports. So no, it's not the operating system. It's, you know, when you install the compiler, it will come with that. Uh, okay, that's all the questions I see. And it has been a long lecture and I have another one coming up in a couple of hours. So I got to go rest my voice. Thank you all so much. See you on Tuesday for the next lecture.